welcome everybody to a we're gonna call it special a special podcast not the normal podcast we have named it the michael hamilton experience we're talking to two time back to back calling winner michael hamilton this week an outcast haven podcast starting now Welcome, welcome, Michael, and congrats on not one, but two Guardian victories at Callings. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, Jason, Jason and I feel a little bit, you know, we're we're probably even happier than most to have you on here because we ourselves are Guardian truthers. We've been Guardian players like the whole time. So seeing someone win with Guardian and then having them on is, is extra special for us. So. Oh, yeah, and I hate, I hate Guardian, but you know what? He's like a really <laughs> great guy, so I'm, I'm here for it as well. <laughs> I think I think Guardian kind of evokes that. You either love the slow, big hits style, or you hate it. There's not really in the middle. Yeah, I've tried to play it three times. I've bought and sold tectonic plating three individual times, <laughs> trying like trying to get oh, into God. it. New set comes out. I'm gonna get into it this time, and then I sell it, and then I'm next set. Well, maybe now. No, I can't. You did, so for you everybody, did like you did like Valda. Valda was fun. Right. I went for Valda. Yeah. I mean, she's fun. I like Valda a lot. But for anyways. everybody listening, we're going to uh, we're just going to run through some questions on everything that goes into winning a calling and how that starts from the beginning, and then at the end, uh, we're going to just talk about kind of over what we think is going to happen with Banny Rada, if anything's going to happen, and then just kind of a little lead up to the to the pro tour, because that's a huge event coming up. So, Blake, you want to take her away, and we'll we'll start a nice, yeah. fun discussion tonight, today, uh, I think, or whenever you're listening. Or, yeah, whenever you're listening. So I, I think one of the questions that is always interesting to me is, like, what your history in TCGs is. Like, are you a life, or are you someone who played your entire life, is fab, you know, your first game, if, if it is, you've very quickly ascended to the mountaintop of TCGs and I would be wildly impressed. Um, but what, so Michael, what, where have you started? What have you played? Like, what's your TCG history? Yeah. So as a kid, I played Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh very casually. They didn't even play with the correct rules most of the time, but I've been playing card games basically my whole life. Um, late in high school and my early college years, I started learning Magic the Gathering, and uh, first I played it with just some friends, and then I started going to local Friday Night Magics, and then uh, I started playing that more competitively. I did pretty well for myself in competitive level Magic events before COVID started, um, and all the events kind of shut down, and I still played a little digitally, but it wasn't the same not going to events, and then uh, and then I found Flesh and Blood around uh, a little before Aria pre-release. Oh, wow. So I haven't been playing for that oh, long. Yeah. You just got into it. That had to, well, it was what, five months ago? Uh, Six, more than September? five months ago. I don't even know. I believe September, I... August, September was because uh, Vegas was the release oh, out of yeah, September yeah. for so, Aria. Yeah, so yeah, been... But, still, but yeah. still relatively recent. Yeah. That's so awesome. it was probably July or August when I started. I don't know the exact gotcha. date. Going from what was it? Was it a hard adjustment going from like magic? Because we have seen a lot of magic players come over. What was the adjustment like for that coming over to Fab? Um, the games are very, very different, which means that like a lot of skills don't transfer over. But I spent, I haven't played for a lot of time in terms of like months and years, but I spent a lot of hours actually playing the game, learning the systems and. Yeah, uh, getting used to flesh and blood, I guess. And Jason said that you go around testing. You you're like, hey, I'll be on a little in a little bit, but I'm getting some testing in. It's like, oh, yeah, I hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> what spice is he cooking up? <laughs> uh, I was actually playing some old Hyman Blitz, <laughs> playing some Earth Lore Bounty, trying to make it work. Nice. Oh, there you go. We like that kind of spice. Yeah. So going into 
I guess a little bit of like some downtime. I don't know. What's your pre what's your pre pro tour prep looking like? Is it are you taking a little break, just like enjoying Blitz, having fun with it, or are you like already in the grind for testing? Uh I wouldn't say I'm in the grind. I'm still playing a little bit and thinking about the game a lot. Um before I played Blitz today, I played a little bit of Lexi in Class Constructed because I re- haven't really played with her much and I'm trying to play characters that I think have potential depending on our announcement the announcement on Tuesday. I don't really want to be jamming like Starvo or Prism or Viscerai right now until we get more updates, but for sure. Yeah. That's sort of where I think that's kind of where we're all sitting. Like we're we're in letting Blitz be a little bit of a breather right now before we really know what we're gonna be looking at for for Pro Tour and stuff coming up. So So before uh let's see before nationals where was that orlando we were down there um our buddy john was also on oldham in that tournament he top aided that when you won that one going into that what did because everybody knew that it, the field was going to be heavy heavy briar what did your prep look or what did you do prepping up to that victory or how did you how did you come with that deck in that? Like how much testing did you have? So, uh, until two weeks before that event, I had played almost no classic constructed cause I was mostly practicing tales limited for Cincinnati <laughs> and old time was my favorite character in the, the limited format, both in sealed and draft. I was pretty heavily biased towards playing old time. And then after that event, I ended up top eating that and I was like, okay, I I was pretty hooked on the game. I started playing a lot more class constructed because there were no more limited tournaments coming up. And I was playing Oldheim against my friend Roger's Bolton deck. And we had a lot of good games and I like learned a lot of sequencing stuff. And I wasn't even sure I was going to Orlando. And then Matt Folks won the uk nationals with briar and briar was on the rise and uh basically i kind of stumbled into a deck that had a good matchup with briar because i was playing i was enjoying playing old time anyway and briar's rise kind of uh led me to want to go to orlando because i like played that matchup and the matchup felt good and then i tuned the deck a little bit more to be even better against briar in in that lead up did you did you practice much into prism because we did bravo shield for the briar and it worked phenomenally well into briar but it was it's a bad prism matchup i mean the guardian traditionally has that did you find that issue with oldham or were you trying to avoid them or did you have a pretty good game plan into prism uh i was really hoping the briars would take care of the prisms for me cuz <laughs> Yeah, uh, they did. I, I did not. Uh, I played the matchup a couple times, got smashed. I'm like, this matchup's awful. Hopefully, I dodge it. And I honestly didn't have time to even figure out a solid plan for the prison matchup. I was just on the dodge it and hope. That that feels Jason like was, uh, Jason it, was too. Jason was too, and he ended up playing four, three. I got three prisms. Oh, no. yeah, like, Swiss. <laughs> It was yeah. ridiculous. At Nationals, three prisms. It's just my it's, life. I, I find prisms everywhere. At our yeah. at the last ProQuest we were at, <laughs> I built I built uh, New Bravo specifically to beat New Bravo. So heavy staunch, heavy turn timber, all that good stuff. And mm-hmm. I faced three prisms. So I took away the stuff that yeah. beat prisms and uh, just couldn't couldn't get through them. So I'm, a prism, I'm a prism magnet. Yeah. Yeah, he always finds them. It's it's funny how that's kind of been the case for Bravo is like going into these big tournaments like Guardians have traditionally had the attitude where it's like, okay, if we're in a faster format where there's a deck that has a good prism matchup, hopefully if I just don't hit one round one or two by round three, they'll all be like one and one or oh and two. And I just mm-hmm. won't see them the rest of the day if I can beat a couple because that was like the chain the same thing with chain in uh in vegas was the same idea was like chain beats prism i lose to prism hopefully i see chains and i don't see prisms and then i just dodge them for the first three or four rounds and i let chain kind of beat them up the same thing with briar 
Yeah. Do you have with with your testing? Do you have an extensive group of people, or do you have multiple people you test with right now regularly? Uh, I my best fl- friend Roger got me into the game, and he's like my main testing partner. We probably went through a case of Aria playing Aria sealed to practice for Cincinnati, and I've played most of my class constructed games with him. And then there's a lot of good people in Indianapolis that I also played with a bunch leading up to both. Well. Not as much Orlando, but I played it with a few indie people leading into the Indianapolis calling. Nice. Is that? Are you from Indy? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a local to Indy, so it was nice having a tournament 20 minutes from my house. That's oh, amazing. Geez. That's really nice. Yeah. That'd be you guys nice. remember that? Remember when we had that? Yeah. That how many? <laughs> so leading up into that, how many hours or how many days a week do you do you practice going into a calling style event? Um. Leading up to it, I played I played probably a couple hours most days of the week until like the week before. And then the week before I played like probably around three hours a day every day. Okay. For that week leading up into it. I was like, his answer's about to make me really sad. He's gonna be like, I tried to get a game or two in a week. Like <laughs> I'm just gonna be like, Oh my god, I'm so bad at this game. And then the the Friday before I jammed like the entire day, the Friday before yeah. the calling. That's that's interesting too, because it's always I'm always curious if people are on the almost like the athlete regiment where it's like grind until the day before and then take a break and then be like refreshed and ready. But then other people are just naturally is that how you've always been as a gamer? Do you, are are you somebody who just likes to play a lot? You don't find because I know some people are really mental fatigue weary like they're very concerned about that like playing a guardian like old him and then playing even like starvo like the more controlly style like those are very mentally taxing decks like how do you feel throughout the ter- your tournament run so far how is that worn on you or do you feel pretty good about that part of the game um i guess my history of magic i i like playing control decks in magic tournaments and i was magic tournaments were sometimes like nine rounds in a day And then they were best two out of three. So you had to play a lot of games. Mm -hmm. I guess it kind of helped me build up the endurance to uh, play so long and so intensely. So you always been, because that was something I was curious about too. Like is your history in TCGs, like with magic, you found yourself always being a control player. player. Was that why you kind of naturally seemed like you transitioned into the Guardians well? Is because you like that style of game plan where you're able to have a little more agency with your game process and plan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like the games that go longer because you have like more decision points. And theoretically, if you have more decision points, that means you have more opportunities to leverage play skill. I'm not sure that's always the case. A lot of mm-hmm. a lot of turns kind of play can, themselves, but your opponent can make a mistake. Yeah. Feasibly, somebody can make a, a minor mistake that may or may not cost him the whole game, mm-hmm. allegedly. Yeah, yeah like, theoretically. Shuffling theoretically. equipment yeah. in your deck, yeah. all kinds of <laughs> stuff you can do. <laughs> Jason's got a history of just doing one stupid thing a game and just punting. You know. Well, I was more talking about something else there. I was hinting at something yeah, else. yeah, maybe maybe they, something they in indie that happened, but yeah, yeah. They oh, it. oh, that was leave way it. over my head. I thought you were yeah, leave it sorry, yourself. sorry. I thought you were leave it, leave it to leave it to a prism player to just miss <laughs> miss a trigger. Yeah, miss that. <laughs> <laughs> something just didn't, something didn't tick with you. Something didn't tick with you. <laughs> Oh, I'm so happy I with Warren right this. now. I'm in such a good mood for being an idiot because that opened such a good door. All right. So I, I will say this. Watching a lot of the games from India, I watched a ton. Um, you were the calmest player I've ever seen play where you don't show the crazy emotion, the people rocking, the heads down, they're shaking their hat, they're going crazy. You just sat there the whole time. I'm like, wow, this is, I think that's what makes a good player. So we couldn't hear you. Do you talk to your opponent at all? Do you like mildly talk in their head, do anything fun like that? Yeah. um, (laughs) I try to carry a conversation while we're like shuffling and getting ready. And then like during the game, I am usually pretty verbal about announcing my triggers and try to uh, clearly say what's happening. Um, 
in the no, finals. Side, no, any side banter? Any side banter while you're doing that? Uh, not that much. Not really. Yeah, Jason, it, you're an ass. Not everyone's like. I love. I, not no, I just like, like talking. I just like talking during the game. If I don't my deck well enough, I just like talking. It's yeah, fun. I enjoy that. I like armories and like testing. I am more verbally talking about random stuff or stuff related to the games but most of the time in tournaments i'm pretty serious sometimes something like that feels silly will happen and i'll comment on it but for the most part Mm -hmm. i'm pretty in the in the zone focused yeah do you do you notice that like a lot of your opponents like they're rocking and all their gestures like because it seems like to me that's giving you like the confidence i'm like oh this he's he's messed up in the head right now and it makes me more confident i don't know if you see that or if that happens because i saw it happen with your opponent several times that were giving such negative body language of i just screwed myself it was amazing (laughs) uh honestly i don't really even notice i'm very focused on the cards during the game and not super focused on their body language that's fair that's yeah. totally fair. <laughs> well, that, that's just me being in sales my whole life. You're always looking at people's body language because it tells a story. So I always pay attention to that. And that's why I immediately noticed with you, you're just flatlined, which is a good place to be in cards. Now you just need to get the big poker style headphones and the dark glasses, and then nobody <laughs> will know what's going on. <laughs> so when... Like leading up to these tournaments, you said that you felt like Olden was the the right call and kind of is what encouraged you to go to Orlando. Leading up to this tournament, did you go with Starvo because you felt like you could build a version of him that had a good like a good game plan into the meta as a whole? Were you trying to target specific decks? Like, what's your approach? And you're looking at a tournament that's coming up, like how you assess the meta and what you're going to take, how you're going to build the deck and your fine tuning. Like, what do you look at when you do that stuff? Yeah. So both for Orlando and for Indianapolis, I felt like there was like one deck that was considered to be the best deck and it would be, I thought it would be the most represented by a reasonable amount. So whatever I do, I want to make sure I have a good matchup into that deck. And then once I've, guaranteed or felt like i've had a good match have a good matchup into that deck i'll do whatever i can to like increase my chances against the other decks but not at the cost of what's going to be the most popular Mm -hmm. so uh for this turn or for indianapolis i got to play eight defense reactions six of the big ones and two sync blows and i felt like that gave me a pretty big edge against other starvo decks and then uh after I had that figured out, I just did what I could to try to shore up my Prism matchup, shore up my Viscerai matchup. Um, and I honestly felt like my Viscerai matchup wasn't as good as a lot of other star- versions of Starvo mm-hmm. for that matchup. But I think that's one of the higher, probably one of the highest variance matchups in yeah. current Flesh and Blood is Viscerai versus Starvo. So, yeah, when they see Sonatas, if they see Sonatas, like, how are like yeah. that's such a big determining they're, factor yeah their early game their early game like rune chant production is so high variance it feels like because for every every you know handful of matchups you have where it feels normal you've got one matchup where they make like three rune chants in five turns you have another matchup where they you know turn zero they're like a mordred tide mordred tide pitch a blue read the runes make 72 rune chants and then <laughs> they come out of you and you're like uh i don't know what you uh, what okay cool yeah sounds yeah. good and not even just on the viscerai side because on the starvo side normally when your hands are like weaker and not revealing not uh, activating starvo's ability you can spend your cards defensively to block and buy more time against viscerai you don't get to do that so you basically just have to play the hands you're given and play your hand, the hands you're given as for as much damage output as possible and sometimes you reveal to starvo and you have 13 damage turns or tw- or 15 damage turns or a fused oak and old turns and other times you're like i'll play my yellow autumn's touch for six your turn yeah, yeah. <laughs> what uh, uh in when you did uh for swiss what were did you have how many losses did you have in swiss i had two 
what what decks did you lose to in Swiss? I was just kind of curious on that. I lost to Fino's Prism the last round of day one. And then I lost a Starvo Mirror uh, the first round of day two. Um, did you play many Prisms in uh, Swiss? Other than Fino and Swiss, I played against the Prism round one. And that was okay. the only other Prism I played against. Okay. And then, other feel- than that, you get a pretty big wide variety. Because I know sometimes at the yeah. callings, you get. I mean, I played an Azalea in round five in Vegas at 4 1. I was shocked to see an Azalea <laughs> there. So it's like sometimes you run into. Did you have any like weird decks that you ran into later in the days? Uh, day one, I played against a reasonable amount of weird decks. I played against the Kano in the, either the 4 or the 5 bracket. And I played against a Sabres Bolton also. In day one. Um, and then other than that, I think it was mostly Viscerai and Prism yeah. and Starvo Mirrors. And then day two, I played against Chain. And then in the top eight, I played against Chain and Briar. And then the rest of it was just Viscerai, Prism, Starvo. Was a, was a Chain you saw day two? It wasn't Cody both times, was it? It was. It was. I played Cody so twice. So you, you played two people twice in that tournament. Yes. That's insane. That's wild. <laughs> That's insane. We're both of, so the Cody, when you, I saw that match up, that one was pretty close. He, it, it shocked me. As soon as he figured, I, I don't know, did, did you go straight fatigue in the first game you played against him? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Because it seemed like he changed his plan a couple turns in, in the, the top eight and i didn't know if he'd played it similar where he didn't shackle a couple times which was you know trying not to fatigue his deck i don't know if that was on purpose or if that was miss shackles yeah he, he he knew i was probably going to fatigue him or at least like have fatigue as part of my plan uh going into the top eight so mm-hmm. i think that's why he skipped one of the shackles yep yep okay it, it makes sense I've seen that yeah it's so, it's always interesting those those like matches where you play somebody twice in a tournament at any point like where you see them in Swiss and you see them again. Did you feel like that? Like, since you played them both, did you feel like you had a better read on that matchup in the top cut just because you actually had a chance to play them versus, cause you guys got to see lists in the top cut, right? Is that what yeah, we did. So like that knowledge was obvious, obviously the same on both sides, but did you feel like there was an advantage or disadvantage to the, that second round where you had an opportunity to kind of see the deck in action and how they pilot it? Cause sometimes you can see the same deck with somebody else, but that pilot very much plays lines that you can kind of pick up on. Yeah. I think uh, going into the top eight, seeing deck lists probably helped Cody against me. Cause he knew my strategy. He knew how many copies of my defensive cards I had. And mm-hmm. I didn't gain that much from seeing his deck list. It was an aggressive chain. I did learn that he only had Husk as his only armor option, which led me to want to stay on the fatigue plan, even though I knew he even though I knew he knew that I wanted to fatigue him. Seeing that he only had Husk and no other options, uh I was I was considering pivoting to a more aggressive approach. But then seeing he had Husk and he never would he couldn't sideboard into a, a more anti fatigue chest piece encourage me to stay on the fatigue plan if that makes sense yeah yeah, no, yeah totally for sure sense. do do you like that they showed deck lists in top eight i i do i i really like the information i think it helps i feel better about the decisions i'm making with deck lists and i think that if they don't show deck lists in the top eight you're kind of at a disadvantage the more coverage matches you play because if your opponents go back and watch your coverage matches or they have friends that watch them and share information with them, mm-hmm. uh, it can so. put you at a disadvantage, which is, I believe, the reason they do it. Yeah, because yeah, they, yeah, they basically could have gone back and got your exact card counts from your matches and had a huge advantage, like you said, by knowing all your defense reactions without you having their knowledge. That, that makes sense, yeah. especially it in a basically, big high-level event. Yeah. Basically the equivalent of like having a scout team versus not having a scout team. Cause I know we yeah. absolutely, like we absolutely did that when we were down at Nats. Like we had um, a guy that we played with that went into top eight and there was definitely some quick scroll backs 
through like the the live stream. We're like, oh, this guy he played on the screen. We got to go look at his. And we were like, talking strategy <laughs> based on what we saw. And to your point, like coverage actually could have hurt that matchup a little bit because it's like, well, now I can count exact number of copies of cards. Like if you have two and I see two, or I'm worried about the third. Well, guess who's not worried about a third copy of Sync Below anymore because it watched you know Michael's game, but Michael didn't watch my game. He doesn't know how many copies I have. That kind of thing. Yeah, and it it also allows them they can just completely post the deck list on the coverage, so like mm-hmm. they can share the top eight decks completely before the match and not give someone an advantage for knowing the opponent's deck list. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that rewards also a higher a higher skill cap player as well by looking at a, a deck list and being able to formulate a plan? Um I think I think it does raise the skill cap, but I don't think it's necessarily for the best to do it because it discourages showing up with like rogue decks. So like if you sit across from your opponent and they're playing Lexi and the main way people play Lexi is like this ice mid range Lexi deck. And then Mm -hmm. they actually are on like a lightning Lexi and you don't get to see their deck list. They get an advantage for bringing a unique deck that they kind of like brewed up. And I think that's good for the game to do that. But at the same time, I think once you get to top eight, it, you're, they're probably going to know as, what kind of Lexi deck you're on anyway. As soon as someone sees yeah. that the only weapon you brought was Death Dealer or something, they're like, oh, okay, well, I know what this deck's <laughs> doing. Like, <laughs> That makes sense. That's a good point, actually. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So talking about being I mean, in Indianapolis, like, what's your, I guess, how's your local scene? Like, is it pretty, is it pretty exploded? Like, is it gotten big? Are you playing every, every night of the week they got stuff going on? Or is it still kind of growing? Or where are you at with that? I like hearing how like these top these, these top players, how their local scene is doing, like how, you know, if they're really involved or if they just kind of like play online and then go to tournaments or what the what the deal is. Yeah, um, our local scene here is solid. There's like probably like 15 to 20 people that play weekly here. Um, we have a store that runs events on Mondays, a store that runs events on Fridays, but we don't really have anything the rest of the week. Mm um the players that do play pretty actively though they they care a lot they're playing a lot they'll they're often down to play games online even on those days that we don't meet up and Mm -hmm. everyone's just trying to get better and it really helps to be in like such an active community even if it's a smaller one oh it's awesome yeah when so i got a question when you're doing your locals do you run the same deck or are you like mean just pick a different deck every day of the week and just run whatever just because it's fun um it depends like i don't actually make it to the events a lot of the time because uh just like scheduling conflicts and stuff but i play a lot with people online even like local people online and of course my buddy roger um depending on what we're doing if we're like practicing for a big event or a big event's coming up soon i'll play like usually the decks i'm considering playing mm-hmm. but in like the downtime like now if i play a game i'm playing something more for fun than yeah for fun or for experimenting more than like a deck that right. i'd be trying to win a tournament with because it definitely is downtime until monday between sunday night and tuesday morning with new zealand whenever they yeah whenever they release it <laughs> whatever it comes mm-hmm. up what uh so with this ban errata coming do you do you want do you think anything's going to get hit if you do what heroes or do you have any speculation of what would get hit i'm curious what your thoughts are on that oh i think something will probably change mostly more than because i think something needs to change more based on their track record when chain was oppressive they banned things from chain and then when briar was strong they banned things from briar even though I personally don't know if Briar needed to be hit. Um, I think they're pretty likely to touch Starvo. And I think there's a chance that the Rune Blades get hit too, because the Rune Blades have been on top for so long. And they're not on top right now, but they're still like up there. Hmm. I it wouldn't surprise me if they don't touch Prism though. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you bring up the Rune Blades, because I feel like Starvo and Prism are both like the talk of the town right now for like things to get hit but my my argument the only argument that i've 
subscribe to about Prism not getting touched because I think the big fear and the reason Prism comes up is like if Starvo goes away, who gatekeeps Prism from just being this bad guy in the format? And I think that that is actually probably like a Briar or a Chain or someone that like can aggro Prism quickly if there's no changes <laughs> to Prism at all. And, and then you could totally just like correct me if you think I'm wrong here. But I like, but if if you're saying that you think the rune blades get hit a little bit, then that I think actually does kind of create a problem where I don't know if there's it would I mean, I don't know how it would play out, but Prism seems like a pretty solid meta call at that point, I think if Starvo and Rune Blades get chopped at. I don't know. Yeah. I'm I'm not really sure, I guess, because I think I think Prism right now struggles against Briar and Chain, and even some Mysteride X can line up pretty well against Prism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd be curious what they would do. I know, like, most people's biggest gripe in Rune Blades is if they would make, they, that they would make some sort of change to the, uh, sword just to like just to put rosetta in back to briar where they feel like like where it belongs versus just everybody having it in immediately in the go to your it does, home yeah Too like it's a it's it's a green plant sword why does viscera <laughs> have it he's not from aria right you don't deserve that sword <laughs> he found it on his many journeys across the <laughs> the world where'd he go where what's he doing i never know what he's doing Heard this oh, go, guys. Don't wander around. <laughs> Rune Chain Blades just like, in, yeah. They Chain heard the, he, when they saw the Everfest going on, Chain thought it was a rave. So that's why he showed up in all the shackles and, you know, pierced yeah, nipples. Leather like, top. Oh, look at this fucking sword. This is sweet. I'm taking this with me. That's why Chain has it. He was just looking for some action and found a sword. <laughs> We've all met yeah. there. So, all right. Oh, I, you know, looking for some action and found a sword. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. We've all been there. <laughs> it happens. It happens to the best of them, right? Especially with Chain. Oh, God, hey, were you stationed? I stuff. thought you were stationed in Poland, not Thailand. <laughs> good first some action. You found a, a sword? Uh, so, uh, you know, I always like a little controversy. We can't have a podcast without any controversy. I don't want to. So I'm going to. I don't want You don't want to? Right? No. Nope. Oh well, all I'm right. over. I didn't, I didn't know you're being, being like that. <laughs> I was gonna, I wasn't gonna ask you anyway, so you, you can just sit there and be quiet. <laughs> I'll just be here. <laughs> what did uh, what do you think about all the uh, the Facebook posts, uh, Michael? Post post your win about the you know tunic counter stuff. Yeah, yeah. How, how like like is that was your like? I don't know. I I. Without knowing how you felt, I was pretty vocal that, to me, it bothered me just because I hate when people have to shine a light on themselves. And even one person, I think it's, it was the Fluke in the Box uh, YouTube channels, like, I didn't see it that way. I'm like, well, what do you mean you didn't see it that way is shining a light? If you constantly post about yourself, how is that not making something about you? So it bothered me. I don't know if it bothered you. Probably didn't bother you. It was probably just old man me that it bothered more than anything. <laughs> I'm just curious how you felt about that. Um, I it didn't really bother me. I think Fino is a great player, and he did really well at the tournament, and he did make a pretty big mistake. And I think like he kind of posted almost making fun of himself for the trigger. He's like, "Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I threw away the tournament because I didn't remember my trigger." basically and the community latched onto it they like thought it was funny that a lot of people a lot of people thought it was funny and that's why it kind of took off so well and like i don't feel like uh i said the same thing on another interview recently but yeah yeah, i I don't i don't think it takes away anything from the winner for someone to like publicly claim they made a mistake um i think flesh and blood's a really hard game and you're going to make everyone's going to make mistakes. Everyone's learning more as they play and like publicly acknowledging your mistakes doesn't take anything away from the winner in my opinion. Yeah. And, no, I, mean, and I, that's a fair way to look at it. I don't yep, one... And I had no issue with it. It was just a constant. 
if he had let it go after that, I'd have been fine. And it was just the community that that came in. Then I would have said anything. But he kept posting memes about himself to keep the the ball rolling. Like if it slows down, you just throw another one out there. Like I gotta put something out there. This is slowing down. I need to see my name a little more and just put it. So that's what bothered me. So yeah, I, it's it's fun to be in the spotlight. So I don't I don't know I don't play. Yeah, you're such a nice guy, Michael. All right. Yeah. I mean, Michael, Michael I don't know, gets, Jason, Michael, I don't yeah. know you're going to get what you want. You're not going to get Michael to yeah. be like, yeah, fuck that guy. Like, hey, you're not going to do did it. You, get, you, got the, you got that new voice editor and we can just move his lips, right? Oh, no. <laughs> God, no. I mean, the, the beauty, the I'm beauty is, beauty is, right? Like, Michael gets the forever glory, right? Like, anybody who does something after an event where they like hunted or screwed the pooch. Like they they get to be that flash in the pan. Like they're like the Ball brothers back in the NBA when like Lavar Ball, the dad, was like making it all about his boys, but none of them actually did. Like they were all right there. Like they were good enough to be in the NBA, but they weren't winning championships or anything. Michael gets to be like the real superstar who's got he's got the trophies on his shelf. What difference does it make to him if That's somebody true. has a little? They get a little flash in the pan. His name's forever etched in history as two time calling champion, right? <laughs> oh, he's. He's, he now gets to be right there, right? Now, like, Matt Rogers is looking over his shoulder like, oh, no, I was the first two-time calling champion. Michael could be the first three-time calling champion. Like, Matt Rogers <laughs> You're has He's playing in the Pro here. Tour. So uh, what happens? Can we, if you win the Pro Tour, can we just call it a three-peat, even though it's not the calling? Uh, it, I, it's like a conductor. Sorry, I, I, I do want to pause and go back for a second. I don't think matt rogers is the person that has two calling wins i thought it was sasha Ma- sasha markovich yeah sasha, oh, perfect yeah, sasha he works does, for yeah. lss yeah. Though, so he's not yeah, he works for, <laughs> sasha's a great guy he's interactive <laughs> we love sasha <laughs> <laughs> oh. it, i think is does sasha have two sasha has two yeah he okay. was, I, yeah. Think right. he, I think actually to michael's point i think sasha was the first two-time Got calling it. champion yeah Got okay because yeah. they he retired won, he him actually... they forcibly retired him that was yeah. LSS nerfing. <laughs> yeah, actually, they gave him a job LSS, right that was yeah. ss nerfing the community they're like all right this sasha guy was is the working first for us living now. legend yeah he was the first <laughs> living they retired him into living legend status <laughs> all right so leading up to the pro tour big event coming up do you you know there's a lot of people from all over the world flying in for this you got the new zealanders the Aussies all coming in. Have you watched any of their gameplay at all? Or wouldn't you take it that serious? Do you go, do you, do you, do you go full like coach, you know, dark room, you got the screen up, you're going through the YouTube slow motion, how we laid the card out. Did he tick the tunic? How did he play it? Did he pitch first? Is he playing the card first? What order is he going in? Do you go through the full, <laughs> the full array? Uh, uh... I don't go quite that far. I do enjoy watching flesh and blood games. And I feel like there's a lot to learn just from like watching how people play and like the style of decks they bring. So I watched a lot of, uh, I watched some of New Zealand and national or sorry, New Zealand and Australia nationals coverage. Um, but I'm not like studying like specific players or their habits or anything. It's just like more like learning about decks and cards and different ways that you can, put them together or how people play different turns, I guess. Yeah. What's what's going to be really cool in my mind is, and I'm sure you've noticed this is our meta in America is not what it is in Australia and not what it is in New Zealand. That's going to be, that's going to be hard to prep for. Like you, if you prep for an America meta, it's going to be a lot of America. I, I would imagine that the majority of the players are going to be America, right? Yeah, Just it is in the U.S. Here. Percentage wise, yeah. Percentage wise, um, only because we live here, not for any other reason than that. But it's going to be hard to prep, I would think, going into this because they run their decks differently in other parts of the world. Yeah, I I think like the decks that we play are probably going to be pretty similar to some of the decks they play. Like I don't, I imagine like our Starvo lists are probably going to have a lot of overlap with theirs and the way you play against them are probably pretty similar and same for prism same for viscerai but what i'm really worried about is like the heroes that i don't see at all here and i hear like i hear like katsu is all over the place over there i've i haven't played against the katsu i don't know how that matchup goes <laughs> and so i'm worried about like the heroes that have more representation over there than here more than like 
different versions or more than I'm worried about Mm -hmm. them having slightly different takes on the same characters. Yeah. Having people bring over like an actually well-built, well-piloted dash and being like, Oh shit. What's this do? Yeah. I get that. That makes sense. It's a valid fear. (laughs) If if you want to sign up for my, uh, my Katsu killer class, I joke about it with locals all the time that people are always like, Oh my God, I lose the Katsu. I'm like, I know I can teach you. I can, I can teach you. It's like, it's it. like Dory. It's like when, it's when like we Dory, first yeah. started, when we, so we first started playing an arcane. Well, right after arcane. Yeah, Ar- arcane. In the States, yeah, arcane and Dorinthia was like the punisher of new players because yeah, yeah. you had to know how to block Dorinthia. And I feel like that's just Katsu now. Like if you yes, don't know yeah. how, if you're not tight and like, disciplined then katsu will just steamroll in i mean to, to be fair I, you're a guardian player and if you play crown shield you basically gain like 30 percent automatically in your win loss percentage because when they just cannot kadachi you the entire game it's like they never land a kadachi the entire game unless it's like way on the back end and they do it just out of spite they're like no no no, no. i'm saving my kadachis for the end because i want to hit you with the kadachi one time <laughs> Just one time, I want to kadachi you. That's the only way they're going to get an even bigger than that out, is that way. Yeah. And I will say, with the whole Dory thing, I mean, I was personally abused by my wife playing Dory while I was playing Bravo. The first, <laughs> when we got the hero boxes, the first ones, I mean, I was abused. I was like 0-7. I... I'm like, this game sucks. I can't <laughs> beat, I block her, and she hits me for more. Well, how the hell do I do this? <laughs> I remember, so I went back, it was like two weeks ago now, and I watched like our first like five podcasts because I hate myself and I wanted to cringe oh, for a couple hours. And I can't even you, watch myself currently. You were upset. You were really mad that you could not beat Beth playing Dorinthia against you. That was really, that was pretty entertaining. It's horrible. Now she doesn't even play. She'd probably still win. She'll like, I'll play. <laughs> <laughs> Dorinthia. Now we play board games. Now we play board games. And I went, I was 0-3 going into Sunday night. And I finally took a game off of her by like two victory points. I was, and we play, you know, like some hard Euro style games. And then, like, I was, we were playing, we played Western Legends. I'm like, oh, I got you. I was way ahead. Nope. She had all the little shit, and there goes her victory points at the end, right past mine. I'm like, I hate this game. <laughs> do, you, do you do any of that stuff, Michael? Do you play any board games or anything like that on the side, or do you, you stick with the cards? No, I, I play board games. I'm definitely a gamer through and through. I, uh, I recently picked up Wingspan. Oh, yeah, we have that. That's such so a good, good game. Such a good game. <laughs> did you get the expansion i haven't played the i have expansion. not okay core i just got the base great. version yeah core game is great yeah that's a fun game we got that one yeah love that game yeah i, I think it kind of goes hand in hand once you get into board games card games they all kind of your mind has to function in the same way i mean we play blood blood bowl a little mm-hmm. bit of crisis protocol but blood bowl is fun because you just roll dice and it doesn't matter and you lose and you don't care because you have to kick somebody in the face so you randomly fun. lose half your team in some bullshit matchup and you're like oh okay <laughs> didn't happen it's fine don't be like blake though and play games with like your your nine and nine year old how old is zeph now he's nine yeah. nine you're nine year old and you yep. start counting like the the common deck in the middle of the board like well i know how many of these are in there so i need to figure out what my chances are of drawing <laughs> the us counting cards and ticket to ride. <laughs> my my family my family is like, why are you doing this? I'm like, because there's 12 of every color. Like, I need to figure out if it makes more sense to draw blind or if I should try a different color. And they're like, I get you just not have fun. I'm like, I'm having fun because I'm winning. That <laughs> sometimes maximizing your chances of winning the game is like, I th- I think that's the most fun way to play games a lot of the time. Yeah, so, yeah right. Absolutely. It's just <laughs> and. When you figure out that you're like, hey, if I can count the deck and figure out if it's statistically worth it to draw off the top versus like picking up these yellows instead when I'm was planning on going for oranges or whatever, that that that's cool. That's like uh it's fun to think of that stuff. And then you feel smart when like you're like, Yeah, I figured it out. I shouldn't take the oranges, then you draw two off the board and no oranges slip over and you're like <laughs> Then you just that feels, that feels nice. Then you spike your bag of train cars. <laughs> At your nine year old when you stomp his shit in. Just like, gotcha, bitch. Like, <laughs> hey, making him a stronger person, okay? He's gonna grow up a stronger man. <laughs> I, mean, um, I don't let Mason win anything for free. Nothing nothing for free. Nope. You gotta earn it. Now I just don't play him in sports anymore because 
he works out every morning at 5 30 and i just don't play him in sports so i've never really lost to him in much because i just don't play him anymore now <laughs> just yep. stop playing him no one to stop no one to stop. yeah, after yeah you know one to stop yeah that's yep. a backache i got a cramp <laughs> what uh when you're flying into uh to jersey you're gonna go do some sightseeing go over to over to the uh over to the island uh pre pre pro tour no, I'm just flying down Thursday morning to check in on Thursday and then probably play a little bit, get some rest. I mean, that's not very exciting. You're not going to go find like the, the Kiwis, the Aussies, go out and hammer some beers all night, uh, get two hours of sleep and then just start, you gotta, start jamming games. Yeah. You got to be, you got to be careful what group of New Zealanders you get together. Yeah, you with watch you. out for them. They're going to yeah. try to take you down. You can't yeah. just stay away from them. You're gonna have to say no until after you win something. Don't don't do anything beforehand. Because not every not every human functions like Kale McCreeth. We have found that Kale Kale functions like no human on planet Earth. So. You need a reverse wing. No man. There he goes. That just pulls you time. That somebody tries to get you into trouble to go drink. Yeah. You just have somebody probably become an Something tells me. Her. Something tells me that like Michael's responsible, and he's probably gonna be. Able to <laughs> like, I yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't actually even everything. drink. Oh, see, there you go. That makes well, sense. Well, then you definitely That's should what we've drink. been doing wrong, guys. Definitely, Jesus. definitely don't drink with Kale McCree. Then <laughs> <laughs> don't start there. Not time. only will you be late. Not only will you be late. You will die. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> God, that's gonna be so much fun. I'm really excited. Yeah, we'll have to uh we'll have to meet up. I'm gonna be there probably Thursday afternoon. Come by, say hi, check out the place. I I'm pumped just to be there. I did not get a pro tour invite because I'm not a pro. I'm just an amateur. So I'll just play in the calling. Yep. So I'm doing. There there's no shame in playing it in the calling side event at a big tournament. Yeah, the side event. I'm gonna just the calling. <laughs> I mean, whoever wins it, I'm sure Dylan is just going to say it was a, a, uh, it was a, it was a soft, it was a soft, soft calling. calling. Yeah. (laughs) All the good good players were in the pro tour. You won a soft calling. Like that's that's what people said about Orlando. So that I just had to, Yep. wait, that was said. (laughs) Maybe. I I don't know. I, well, cause I I I mean, a lot of people that were in nationals dropped out and played in the calling. I yeah. mean, there was still what four hundred people. Yeah, well, I mean, it included it included what Matt Rogers. Yeah, and Matt Rogers Matt was in it. Hayden, That's pretty Hayden soft. Dale. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. pretty soft. It was pretty soft. I, I, I know. Anytime you get to a number like that of four hundred, there is so many good card players in the world. It just yeah. becomes hard and inv- inevitable that as you're piling up wins, you're going to be playing very good card players. Yeah. No matter who's in another room playing. Mm-hmm. I've said this before. It's like the, the movie, The Tooth Fairy. Have you ever seen the movie, The Tooth Fairy with The Rock? Jason, Michael? none of us have seen that. You've got to explain that up. No, there's always a kid <laughs> in another town that's working a little bit harder, grinding a couple more games every day, watching a couple more videos of their opponents every day. And they're just yeah. going to come down and they're going to take you out in the knees. Everybody, you got to watch The Tooth Fairy. I mean, seriously, the movie's been out for like 20 years. Watch The Tooth Fairy. <laughs> it's, true. it's a hockey movie. <laughs> so so I am I am curious, Michael, like going forward with Fab, like we've got another full set and then a supplementary set. Is there something like you're excited about seeing this year potentially? I'm just really, ex- like I'm really excited to get another draftable set. I loved Aria. And I played a ton of Aria Limited. I'm really looking forward to the next Limited set, though, because it's been it's been a while, and it's still a ways out before we get it. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, Blake I'm, loved I'm, draft for Aria. I'm I'm looking forward to it too to redeem myself because I was a very good draft player until Aria, and then apparently I opened packs of Aria, and my brain just short circuits, and I have a minor stroke because I cannot win Aria draft. I can't. I. It's my kryptonite, man. My absolute kryptonite. <laughs> oh, I thought it was fucking awesome. I love draft. I love drafting this game. It's so much fun. And Jason, got, I love drafting. Jason turned too. his ship around. Jason was drafting good. Jason was drafting like shit for Monarch. You remember that? You were. You don't think you won a single draft? Horrible. Horrible. Terrible. And then just I did great. Swipey swapped through with Monarch. 
Oh yeah. no. That means that next set I'm going to suck. Yeah, it's Dave's turn. It's gonna... <laughs> Let's go. Psych. It's a team rotation. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if on this next set, if they're going to go four or three, stay at the three heroes or go back to four. That's Two. See, they're going to usurp expectations every set. Two oh, would dude. be the worst thing ever. Do you know how horrible that other way? Who'd you get? Five. Oh, so I only have to figure out half the card? No, <laughs> that's trash. <laughs> Put seven heroes. Seven heroes isn't. <laughs> wait, no, it's six minute ad. It's going to be six heroes. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a so, mechanologist six, ninja hero. Six hero fab. <laughs> uh, it's going to be a mechanologist ninja hero. And then it's going to be a wizard, a brutish brute wizard hero. <laughs> a wizard bard? Where you give each other your deck and you have to play the opposite person's deck. That's going to be the <laughs> wizard bard that's going to be printed in the next set. Is there, it's not mixing so, together. It's you just swap decks I, right I at am, the start. I am curious, Michael. You said you played like Oldham and Starvo, obviously. Like you played a lot of Guardian, you played Control. Is there like another deck in Fab that you genuinely enjoy outside of like, those like Control style decks or something? Because like, Jason and I love to play Guardian, but then we also love to play Kano. Like, to a fault, we love to play Kano. Like, it's it's like, oh, it's locals. It doesn't mean anything. I'm taking Kano and Constructed. I don't, it's like, oh, that for, the, the group that plays there is all Oldham and Chain players and Prism players. I don't even care. Still taking Kano. We're going to see what happens. Um, I'm not exactly sure who my favorite would be i did play a little bit of katsu when i started enough to learn that i really don't like playing katsu <laughs> i've been there it's fair yeah that's how i am with guardian problem man <laughs> um i wanted to like brew and i was excited to see new brute cards and then everfest kind of was pretty disappointing for brute stuff yeah. so maybe when we get a new brute hero i'll be pretty into that if Assuming it's not all like dice rolling stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I don't <laughs> think that Reinar is going to be dice roll centric. So like when new cards that help the brute class generically come out, I think I think it's got to be more like intimidate stuff. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they just don't <laughs> touch that again. But. Yeah. I I really like the random discard element where like you set up your hand to try to discard the cards that you want to discard, and then like you get paid off for doing that. I think that's like. Uh. Nice. I think that's a pretty interesting play pattern. I just think like a lot of the discard cards aren't there on power level currently. So I'm hoping that the next brute does more random discard, but maybe instead of like the whole Reinar's Intimidate thing, maybe they take it in a different direction where they get some other kind of reward for some it. Some benefit. Yeah. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be cool to see them get like a power buff for it versus the Intimidate. Because the Intimidate is a weird mechanic where like it the it gets almost like a theoretical power buff when you pair it with certain combinations of cards, but you have to see like barraging beat down and three intimidates and all these different things line up. And it's like, it, it's weird how they, the, the power curve to your point is feels low because a lot of times those cards, like hard to pitch card to play card to discard. So it, it's like, theoretically it's three cards to get a six power attack off, which is bizarre. Yeah. Um, the, the Intimidate's also, like, it's at its best when decks are very defensive and wanting to defend a lot. And with Runeblades being so strong, Runeblades want to play four or five card hands most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't really want to block much anyway. So that you you're, mm -hmm. you spend resources to say, hey, you can't block me with the cards you want to block with. And they're like, well, I don't want to block anyway. So <laughs> yeah, that's, That happens a lot more, I think. It, it, I think it was just because when they made it, you have which surprises me because I knew it was coming out afterwards, but Brute was good during the WTR and Arcane because mm -hmm. the card pool wasn't huge and there wasn't these super, super go fast decks. You had Katsu and Dash could mm -hmm. boost, but mostly she was control. And now you have such a wide variety of cards and variety that it's very hard that mm -hmm. the Intimidate function just, doesn't Isn't really do what you want it to do. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, Unless you're playing on. with pick a card, any card, and you just turn it into a straight discard deck, you know, get them down to one, see it, pop it. Woo! <laughs> that took me eight <laughs> cards to get that one out of your hand. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that like, that's a good point, because, like, early... Because you would have your hands, and you would want to play, like, a, like, early Welcome to Wraith and Arcane. Like, there wasn't that aggro, right? So you would want to, mm -hmm. like, have your hand and know what you're going to block with and getting that taken away 
forcing you to block if you're going to with something else. That's not really as prevalent now. Like Starville yeah. doesn't give a shit. Intimidate you haven't, you haven't, him. You haven't lived until you've been triple intimidated and the only card left in your hands and unmovable. Yep. You haven't lived. <laughs> Just staring at you're like, uh yeah, no blocks. Yeah. You want to block with that? No blocks. <laughs> you got the unmovable in Arsenal. No, the best is when you set it up, you're like, all right, I got to protect this unmovable. And you've got two reds and two blues in hand. And they just double intimidate the two blues away. And you're just like, yeah. Like, oh. I was so smart. I was so smart. Yeah. What's he? Okay. Jason is currently wrestling a dog. He's uh, She was chewing on my Kano mat. She goes underneath my table and is on top of all my fab mats and just decided to start chewing on Kano. All right. Well, oh, you can, yeah. new dog time. So yeah. just try to <laughs> put him down. <laughs> put him down if you got to. Trade it for a new mat. All right. <laughs> new mat. Anything else you guys want to ask Michael here? We're coming up. We're just coming up on an hour, so. I don't think so. Just I don't know. Anything that you Brad wanted can... to uh, say before yeah, shout we close her off, or... Michael? Anything? Any shout outs? Anything like that? Uh, I guess I'll shout out people I've already been talking about, but Roger Bodie, my best friend, testing partner, talked me into going to Orlando last minute. Not hmm. last minute, but very close to last minute. Good on and you, yeah, <laughs> and the indie scene as a whole, there's a lot of great guys there that I really appreciate having to play with and play test with and talk with. So yeah, shout out to the indie flesh and blood scene. Awesome. And gotta, gotta love the local scene. Yeah. And I did also want to say thanks to you guys for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to chat and yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll have you back on if you win the pro tour. If you don't or if you're in second, we just you know, just don't even contact us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well I'll, I'll try. I'll try. No promises though. <laughs> oh my god. We All definitely right. would like to have you back, especially if these new sets come out. Like we like to pick other people's brains as you're when you, when you start doing deck construction and, and making these new decks and new heroes and new sets come out. So it's always nice to have another uh, person who is very successful come on and talk about some some fun brews. You don't have to give away uh, all your spice, but you know, just a little just a little little dash of sugar is always nice to to give out there as you're as you're as you're brewing up something new. Yeah, if we if we get a new brood in the next set, especially, I'll be I'll be happy to share some some Ooh. thoughts. Uh, Ooh, there you go. All right. All right, we're coming to you next set. Brood's coming out. All right. All right. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Everybody, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed this awesome interview. Really appreciate having you on, sharing your insights, and just telling us, you know, more about your mindset. And it's that's so fun for us to listen to, and we love, you know. Thanks for letting us pick your brain. Be sure to like and subscribe, everybody, and. We will talk to you next week. Peace. See ya.